Um, the first is from Mark 7, um, verse 14 to 23, and the second is Genesis 4, verses 1 to 8. Then Jesus called, called the crowd to him once more and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing that goes into a person from the outside which can make him ritually unclean. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that makes him unclean. When, the crowd, when he left the crowd and went, went into the house, his disciples asked him to, to explain this saying. You are no more intelligent than the others, Jesus said to them. Don't you understand? Nothing that goes into a person from the outside can really make him unclean, because it does not go into his heart, but into his, into his stomach, and then goes on out of his body. In this, Jesus declared that all foods are fit to be eaten. And he went on to say, it is what comes out of a person that makes him unclean. Far from the inside, from, um, from a person's heart, come the evil things which lead him to do immoral, th evil ideas which um, lead him to do immoral things, to rob, kill, commit adultery, be greedy, and do all sorts of evil things, deceit, indecency, jealousy, slander, pride, and folly. All these evil things come from inside a person and make him unclean. Another reading from Genesis 4, 1 to 8. Then Adam had intercourse with his wife, and she became pregnant. She bore a son and said, By the Lord's help I have acquired a son. So she named him Cain. Later she gave birth to another son, Abel. Abel became a shepherd, but Cain was a farmer. After some time, Cain bought some of his harvest and gave it as an offering to the Lord. Then Abel bought the first lamb born on one of one of his sheep, killed it, and gave the best parts of it as an offering. The Lord was pleased with Abel and his offering, but he rejected Cain and his offering. Cain became furious, and he scowled in anger. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why that scowl on your face? If you had done the right thing, you would be smiling. But because you have done evil, sin is crouching at your door. It wants to rule you, but you must overcome it. Then Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out in the fields. When they were out in the fields, Cain turned on his brother and killed him. This is the word of the Lord. Let's have a prayer. Father, we ask you to anoint our ears to receive your holy word. Anoint our hearts to receive your holy word, mighty God. Lord, bless us as we sit in your presence that the knowledge of Jesus Christ would come in among us like a flood. Let your compassion fall upon us today. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Today, we're looking at our spiritual heart. Here are some of the things the scripture says about our hearts. Here are some of the things that scripture says about our hearts. For with the heart, man believe unto righteousness. Romans 10, verse 10. Have reverence for God in your heart. 1 Peter 3, 15. Blessed at the pure in heart. Matthew 5, 8. Keep your heart with all diligence. Romans 4, uh, 30, 23. Luke, um, love the Lord with all your heart, Luke 10, 27. Serve the Lord with all your heart, 1 Samuel 12, 20. These are all good, aren't they? They're all good. But we read in Jeremiah 17 and verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Did you hear that? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. These are very strong words, aren't they? What are the desperately wicked things that are found in our hearts? Let's look at Luke 7, Mark 7, verse 21. 
Out of the heart of a man comes evil thoughts, adultery, fornication, murder, theft, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, indecency, jealousy, slander, pride, foolishness, and the list goes on. All these evil things comes from the heart, and it makes a person unclean. All these evil things come from the heart, and it makes a person unclean. Some of these on the list here um, are some of the things that we saw last week, and we were told um, to write them down and nail them to the cross. Today, we see where these things come from. Does my heart have thoughts, you might be thinking? I didn't know that. Yes, your heart have thoughts. That is what the word of God says. And it's like an archery that supplies the heart with blood. When the archery gets clogged up with fat deposit, it prevents the blood from flowing effectively to or from the heart. And that makes the heart dysfunctional. As a result, it affects the whole body's function. If it is not corrected, it leads to death. Sin in the heart renders the heart spiritually dysfunctional. Sin in the heart renders the heart spiritually dysfunctional. When we have evil thoughts, if left, they will progress into more dangerous actions. Remember the story of Abel that was just read to you. Cain and Abel, the sons of Adam and Eve. Abel became a shepherd and Cain became a farmer. They both brought an offering to the Lord. Cain brought some of the fruits of his soil, while Abel brought fat offerings from some of the first fruit of his flock. We read the Lord looked with favor on Abel's offering, but Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. We're not told why Cain's offering was accepted, but it seems like God had told them, either directly or through their father Adam, what kind of offering he desired. But Abel's offering is close to what is described in places such as Leviticus 3 and verse 18. So he offered a lamb. It is terrible not to be accepted by people, isn't it? Let alone not to have the favor of God. When we feel, when such a feeling comes, we should respond in one of two ways. We go back to the drawing board and ask, why we didn't have favor, and then correct the situation. Or we become angry at God and allow envy to make us hate those that God favors. Cain took the second route. He was angry, and he was very angry, and his face was cast down. God does not abandon people when they've sinned. God does not abandon people when they've sinned. It seems that even after Cain had messed up, God went to look for him, asking him three questions. The first one, why are you angry? Second, why is your face cast down? God knew the answer to the questions, but he wanted to give Cain an opportunity to reflect on his actions. The third question God asked Cain was, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? If Cain dealt with the reason why his offering was not accepted and had confessed 
and he would have enjoyed inner peace, forgiveness, a clean heart, and favor with God. God told him, you have done evil. Sin is crouching at your door. It wants to rule you, but you can overcome it. Sin is crouching at your door. It wants to rule you, but you can overcome it. Cain was not interested in what God had to say to him. The devil persuaded him. The, the devil persuaded Cain to prefer his own way rather than God's way. Cain was not prepared to confess, nor would he listen to God's warning that an unconfessed, deliberate sin would lead to greater sin. Cain's anger at God produced envy of his brother, and it quickly led to hatred and murder. What a thing. What a thing. Cain damaged the relationship between the brothers. Wherever sin is nurtured in our hearts, it will lead to greater sin. Whenever sin is nurtured in our hearts, it will lead to greater sin. How is that? How does that happen? It's by giving ourselves permission to sin. Giving ourselves permission to watch pornography. Giving ourselves permission to read dirty magazines. Giving ourselves permission to watch dirty videos and dirty games. We nurture sin in our hearts when we accept sexual immorality. We live in a filthy world, in a filthy world, there's no doubt about it. Our culture is very deprived and full of filth. And sex outside of marriage is prevalent in God's church to our shame. Did you hear that? Sex outside of marriage is prevalent in the church of Jesus Christ. And it's shameful. Don't accept the lifestyle around you. You are in the world but you're not of the world. You are the Lord's precious child. Stop it. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Would you allow rubbish to accumulate in your house? The smell would be intolerable. Why are we allowing sin to accumulate in our hearts where we have invited the king of glory, to come and dwell. Stop it. Wrong thinking has a deep-seated root in our hearts. And it's another stronghold in the church of God. We think we can do as we please because God is merciful. We think we can do as we please because there is grace. That's wrong thinking. That is wrong thinking. We also believe partial obedience is acceptable to God. That's wrong thinking. So we say, I don't do murder, but I do slander. I don't do covetousness, but I do pride. That is wrong thinking. Some church ministries and church people believe they can lie to do God's work. That is wrong thinking. That was never an option in God's agenda. God does not do lie. And God does not do partial obedience. Remember the story of King Saul. God gave him a command in 1 Samuel chapter 15. Go, fight the Amalekite, the wicked nation, and their sin is so abhorrent, I want to get rid of every one of them. Go and fight against them, completely destroying every one of them. 
Do not leave a thing alive. Kill everyone, including their cattle, their sheep, their camel, their donkey. Get rid of every one of them. He went, to, he went to battle against the Amalekite. Yes, he did that. He obeyed that part of the commandment. But he went to battle and he left the king of the Amorites alive. And he took the best of the cattle alive. Which part of God's command did King Saul not understand? Go and fight the Amalek Amalekites. Get rid of every one of them. I don't want any of them left alive. Get rid of all the animals, in case you didn't understand all. Camels, sheep, goat, donkey. Get rid of every one of them. They're a wicked nation. Get rid of them. That was very straightforward and very simple. Easy. King Saul's excuse was, I took the cattle because I thought it would be good to use them to offer sacrifice to God. Did God ask him for a sacrifice from a wicked nation though? We read in the story in 1 Samuel 15, Samuel came and confronted King Saul for what he had done. And he replied, I did obey God. Yes, I did. I did obey God. <laughs> How did you obey God when you've got the king of the Amorite alive, when all the bleating of the sheep and the cattle are still there? How did you obey God? Samuel said, which does the Lord prefer, obedience or offering of sacrifice? Samuel's conclusion was, it is better to obey God than to offer sacrifices. Did you hear that? It is better to obey God than to offer sacrifices. God demands full obedience, not partial obedience. Don't be foolish in our thinking. Don't expect to act out wrong things and your children will not copy you. Children watch what you do, and they take in what you say. They're going to learn from you. Somebody came to me some months ago and said that a little boy um, in our church um, was saying really filthy words in, in the school playground. Really, really filthy words. And um, I think he must have only been about six or seven. And somebody else came to me years ago now, and um, they don't come to the church anymore, this second family. The boy was eight years old, and he was addicted to pornography. Eight years old, Christian family, addicted to pornography. Apparently, somebody at school had given him the, the code or whatever it was to get on the computer and watch it. And because he has a computer in his room, he was watching it at night. Every night he was into that, eight years old. Parents, you have a responsibility to take care of your children. Children are a gift from God, but they're your responsibility to look after them. You are accountable for your children while they're under your roof. Eight years old should not have a computer in their bedroom where you can't keep an eye on what they're doing. And some parents, including Christians, are so lazy, they will put their children in front of the television while they're busy doing other stuff. And they don't know what their children are watching from what they're not watching. I remember, I don't know if I've said that before, my little grandson, he was only about two and a half or something, and um, he does watch telly, and I had him with me, and I put the television on, and I was in the kitchen, yes. I thought it was children's program, and it was safe. Then he came to me, Nanny, I'm not allowed. I thought, oh, here we go. Went to have a look. It was something about um, Blue Baloo or Balaboo, something to do with um, meditation. 
And his mum wouldn't like, let him watch it. And bless him, he's in my house. I don't know about that because I don't want children put in my home even to watch television, no. So he was watching that. It was my day off. And he came to me and said, I'm not allowed. So I had to turn it over. When you start teaching your children from an early age, they will remember and they will do it. He wasn't in his parents' house, and I wasn't watching him, but he came and found me and said, I'm not allowed, and he had to turn it over. You see, when you have children, you are responsible for their spiritual welfare. Did you know that? You are responsible for them. And there is no excuse to let your children do what they want and expect God to correct them in the long run. It is your job to correct them. It's your job to instruct them. They are children and you are the adults. I remember speaking to a mum months back when we were doing, when we had young inspirations. There were a group of mums there and I thought I'd do parenting classes with them. And one of the little boys was, a, was being very naughty at school. Mind you, eventually they expelled him. He was only six in that Catholic school over in Gordon Road. And um, when I spoke to the mum about it, the mum said, yeah, but if I tell him off, he won't love me. The boy's six. Come on. The boy is six. Get a life. Take your responsibility seriously. What's wrong with you? I didn't tell her that, but I was thinking of that. So what? I'm in the flesh sometimes. Give me a break. You know that? Six years old. And she was frightened to give correction to that child. I had to go through um, Proverbs with them to teach them what the Word of God says about instructing your children. So when we neglect our children because we're too busy making money or building a home in, in the Caribbean or building a home in Africa or whichever, wherever we're building a home, and we don't spend time investing in our children, knowing this generation is evil and filthy, it will come right back to our door and bite us. We need to be careful. We need to be careful. Our children are watching us and they're learning from us. Don't tolerate sin in your heart. 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7 says, The Lord is looking at the heart. The Lord is looking at the heart. And Psalm 44 and verse 21 read, God knows the secrets of the heart. Did you hear that? I can have a secret from you. You can have a secret from me. But neither of us can hide from God. God knows the secrets of our hearts. God saw what was in Cain's heart, and he can see what is in your heart and mine. Judging others is another sign of a dysfunctional heart. It also leads to jealousy, envy, hatred, and so on. Hebrews 4 verse 12 reads, The word of God judges the desire and thoughts of the heart. Did you hear that? The word of God judges the desires and thoughts of the heart. Some people may think it's their duty to judge others. Do you know that? Some people, even in the church, think it's their duty to judge other people. They judge people on their educational status, what they wear, their skin color, where they live, what car they drive, their ethnic background. I remember one time when Stephen and I were young in our marriage, and you know what it's like, you start off poor, everything is secondhand, even the cooker. And <laughs> at least you had a cooker. And I used to work at the Hackney Hospital, and we got a little banger, a little mini. And the, the roof had a hole, and Stephen put cement in it. <laughs> Give us a break. We had no money. We're just starting off. You're newly married. Get over it. And you know me, I've got no shame. The only person I fear is God. Do I look bothered? No. So the cement was in the roof, the hole in the roof, to stop water coming in. I was drying it. The nurses laughed me to score when they saw me getting in my mini with the... I said, yeah, but at least I don't have to stand in the bus stop in the cold. I've got a car. But you see, you see something. People will judge you on anything, even what you drive. Some of them judge you on your background. 
but the word of God will do the judging. Because it is the word of God that gives us instruction on how to live. It's the word of God. Let us look quickly at some of the commandments that are in the word of God. Do not murder, the word of God will judge you. Do not steal, the word of God will judge you. Do not accuse falsely, the word of God will judge you. Do not envy, the word of God. It is all in the word of God. Someone said to me a couple of um, days ago, um, and I'll paraphrase it a bit, but not too much. I have been a Christian for about 30 years, and I have just started reading the Bible seriously. And uh, Did you hear that? 30 years, and they've only just started reading the Bible. I am surprised at the accuracy and up-to-dateness of the Bible. Do you know what? Our hearts are filthy because we do not read the Word of God. The Bible is the Word of God for us. We're too busy reading the newspaper in the morning, but we're not busy in the Word of God to hear what God is saying to us so we can clean up our hearts. It's all in the Word of God, what we should and shouldn't do. But we're too busy with other things and we neglect the Word of God and then we're sorry that our hearts are full of filth. But if you put the light of the Word of God in your heart your heart will be full of light because the word of God brings light. Amen? Amen. And the person continues, it speaks right into today's culture. The word of God speaks right into today's culture. Yes, it does that. Spurgeon says, the word of God is a lion. You don't have to defend a lion. You just have to let it loose and it will defend itself. The word of God is powerful. Let it loose in your heart. Let it loose in your mind. And it will do everything it needs to do. Amen. Amen. Don't merely listen to the word of God when you're here on a Sunday. If you only do that, you'll deceive yourself. Do what it says, John, James 1.22. And it will give you a clean heart. We hear so many sermons here in this church. So many. Thank God this is a church where we're blessed with the word of God week by week. We can't say that we get rubbish teaching here. We get good, solid word of God that will transform our thinking, transform our lives, and teach us the way of God and the way of righteousness. And our heart should be clean. You know your heart and and I know mine. But I'm here to tell you, passivity is your enemy. Passivity is the enemy of your soul. Don't be a spectator with a sinful heart. You may think the world is out of control. Things are so messed up. What difference can I make? I might as well go along with the culture, as messed up as it is, But I'm telling you, as messed up as the world is, God is still in control. He is the Alpha and he is the Omega. And he holds everything in his hands. All things you see happening, it's all on course for the return of Jesus Christ. Go and read the word. You know what the end of the story is already. You know it. One day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Even Al-Qaeda, even ISIS, even the members of Babu Haram, they all have to bow the knee to Jesus and declare that he is Lord. You want to be ready. You want to be holy. You want to have a clean heart. What would you change in your life and in your heart if you knew Jesus was coming back tomorrow? What would you change? I hear some of you saying, but I am too deep in sin to change. I'm here to tell you you're not. No, you're not. God can change you. God can change you. Please make your confession to God. He said in Isaiah 1, 18, Come, 
Let us reason together. Though your, skin, your sin be as scarlet, I will make it as white as snow. Though they be as red as crimson, I can make them wool. Did you hear that? The sin that you're saying is too horrible for God. He's saying, come, 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 bring it to me. Come, let's reason together. Come here, come here now. Let us reason and sort it out. You don't have to walk in guilt and shame anymore. Confess your past sins and forget it. Confess your present sin and begin to live a new life with God. God is full of compassion. Don't listen to the wrong voices in your head. Listen to God. God stopped the world to create you. Did you know that? God stopped the world to create you. And you are unique. There's no one else like you on the planet. Did you know that? You are beautiful in God's eyes. You are worth more than you will ever imagine. In the eyes of God, you are worth everything. You are loved and you're worth dying for. It does not matter what you think about yourself, but God the Father believes that you're worth the death of his son. And Psalm 139 says, you are beautifully and wonderfully made. Wow. Did you hear that? You are beautifully and wonderfully made. That's what God is saying in his word about you. Choose to believe what God is saying about you. Let God help you change the things that are in your heart that you don't want to be there, okay? Listen to what Philippians 4 and verse 13 says. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Did you hear that? No, I can do some things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So, whatever sin that's so terrible, that is so dangerous, that is so damaging your relationship with God, that is so blocking your life because it's clogging your heart, God is able to deal with it. Do you know something? God is really on your side. He is really on your side. He wants to help you. Just as he wanted to help Cain, but Cain wouldn't listen. I wonder, will you listen this morning? I wonder, will you listen this morning? Will you let God help you this morning? Indifference, passivity, and procrastination are your enemies. Did you hear me? Indifference, passivity, and procrastination are your enemies. Don't let them control you. Don't let them control you. They are the devil's weapon against you. God wants to help you, but the devil wants to steal, to kill, and to destroy you. That's his mission. He's not for you. Only God is for you. That's why he says, come, come, let's reason together. Come, let's sort it out. Come, let's sort it out. The almighty God is saying to you, come, come. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Did you hear that? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Do you want to see God? Do you want to see God? I can't wait to see God. I cannot wait to see God. That's my number one passion. I'm ready. Take me, God. I don't know if I've said that here before, but I remember when my mom was on her deathbed in the London hospital. Everybody's there crying, and, and I'm going to my mom. Mom, tell God to take me instead. I'm ready and leave you. That's what I said to my mom on the deathbed. Tell God. Bargain with God for me. Tell him to take me and leave you. Like my mom would listen. My mom's been wanting to go for a long time. Two years, she, four years, in fact. She already did her funeral thing, ready to go. My mom wasn't listening. I'm ready to go. I'm out of here. Do you know something? Are you really ready to meet God? Are you really ready to meet your maker? I'm going to give you an opportunity. If you, like me, I'm already standing. If you, like me, want to see God and you want a clean heart, 
You want the things that you don't want in your heart. You don't want them to be there. You want to chuck them out. I want you to stand just where you are. Stand up just where you are. I'm already standing on number one. I'm the first one in the queue. I am the first one in the queue. God is saying, come. Come, let us reason together. Come. I'm here. I want to reason with you. I love you so much. You're not happy about the things in your heart, and I'm not happy either. I want to rule and reign with you. I want to give you peace. I want you to know life in all its fullness. I don't want you to be ashamed anymore. I don't want you to be full of disgrace anymore. Come to me. Come to me. Give it to me. I want to take it from you. I want this burden to fall away from you. You don't have to carry it anymore. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to speak to your father about the things that are in your heart that you want to kick out today. Do not give the devil permission to captivate your heart. Your heart should be captivated by the Lord Jesus Christ. Take your time now and do business with the Most High God. Do business with God. Lord, we're so sorry for the mess we've allowed our hearts to become. We're so terribly sorry, Lord. We ask your forgiveness. We want our hearts to be a place where the Spirit of God is comfortable, where the Spirit of God is welcome, and where the Spirit of God is blessed. Father, Thank you that you will help us to keep holy. Thank you you will help us to keep our hearts clean and pure. Thank you that your word said, with you we can do everything. Thank you for the strength that you will give us to live right and to think right and to walk right. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you will be our defender when the devil comes to the door, we will send you to open the door. Oh, Lord, we love you. And we thank you for loving us even more than we love you. But we want to give our lives to you today. We want to give our hearts to you today. And we want you to tell you to captivate our hearts. Let your kingdom come and let your will be done. Oh, Lord, we ask it in the strong name of Jesus. Hear our prayer. Hear our cry. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you remain standing, we'll sing a few songs. Purify my heart. Friends. 
I choose to be holy, set apart for you, my master, ready to do your will. Me, sovereign Lord, reign in me. our desire for you to reign in us Lord let your kingdom come in our hearts and let your will be done in our hearts thank you that you are forgiving God thank you that you're so full of compassion thank you that you're understanding God thank you that when you forgive us and you cleanse us we're clean indeed you take our sin so far from us as far as the east is from the west you take it all from us. Thank you, Lord. We have faith to believe in the power of your forgiveness. We have faith to believe in the power of the blood of Jesus to cleanse us from every sin. We have faith to believe. We believe, Lord Jesus, that we are forgiven, that everything that we confess to you this morning, you have taken it away from us, and we have been set free we have been set free, free in Jesus, free in our Lord, free in our God, freedom to live, freedom to have hope, freedom to have courage, freedom to have strength, freedom to live and move in the power of the living God. Blessed be your holy name. Father, help us. Help us, Lord. And I decree that every slumbering spirit will awake to the sound of the Father's voice and be stirred up by the offer of life. I decree that the power of God will prevail over our life. I decree that all of us standing here will be strengthened with power in our inner man. I declare the Lordship of Jesus Christ over our lives and over this church in the name of Jesus. So Lord, will you bless us and keep us? Lord, will you make your face to shine upon us? Will you be gracious to us? Will you lift up the light of your countenance and give us our peace in Jesus' name? Thank you for your peace, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you. Sit down, please. God bless you. Have a good week. Don't go out of here with condemnation. Everything you've given to God, he's got it. 
Supernaturally, he's got it. Don't go out there in shame and disgrace. God loves you. That's why he's brought you here to hear this message. You are free from condemnation. God is on your side. He understands you. He knows everything about you and he's rooting for you. He is rooting for you. He is transforming your life. Let him do what he needs to do. Amen. Give him permission to do what he needs to do. He knows that we're weak. He knows that we're vulnerable, but he will work with us. Amen. He's working with me. And if he can work with me, he can work with you. Tell my husband. He'll tell you what I'm like. Uh -uh. But by God's grace, we're on a journey. We're not there yet. Amen. We're not there yet. But let us be diligent to stay on the path. Amen. Be diligent to stay on the path. Amen.